Recording started. If you want to, uh, that's just a notice to let you know that the call will be recorded. And if you wish to return to the call, if you wish to listen to the recording, you can go on to the eBlex website at your leisure and uh, enjoy listening to the call again. If you're interested in any of the publications that support our conference calls or any of our information, if you go to the eBlex website, www.eblex.org.uk, click on the Better Returns Program button. Under the Health and Forage, uh, under the Food and Forage button, you'll find Sheep Manual Number 12, uh, which Kate Phillips was the author of on U Nutrition. Um, if you go on to the Health button, you'll find the Reducing Land Losses Manual, uh, which I think Harriet was also involved in, and you'll find the Diseases Directory, which I know Harriet also helped us with. So, a couple of health-related publications there. Uh, it's, a, it's a shop full of goodies because if you click on BRP+, Plus, you'll find a publication on trace element supplementation. And if you click on the video button, uh, you can go through to eBlex TV, which means you never need to go out again, ever again. Uh, you can see a video on uh, lamb survival, which uh, is quite a useful video. It doesn't take long to watch. Some useful reminders of things that we probably know we should do and perhaps some new things that you hadn't thought of before. Okay, so the, uh, just to remind you again of that, if you wish to email in questions to either Kate or Harriet, you can email us at brpconf at eblex.ahdb.org.uk or you can text us on 07973 Both speakers have uh, got... I've, I've asked both speakers to sort of... Um, cover their topic in 15 minutes. We'll have a quest couple of questions to each speaker afterwards and a general question session if we've got some uh, unanswered questions at the end, hoping to finish the call uh, in 45 minutes. Kate, I, can I hand over to you and uh, we'll cover your topic on um, compound feeding and feeding up to lambing. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, I've been asked to talk about um, concentrate feed supplementation, home mixing, perhaps, use of straits, and uh, ration formulation. So I always think we should very much start with a forage analysis. If we're considering indoor lambing use and we're basing our diets on hay or silage or even straw, we should really be thinking about what the quality of the forage is. And um, I don't hold with um, people feeding the same amount of concentrates every year because, as you all know, um, forage making conditions vary enormously from year to year. And the season we had this year was incredibly different to the one we had last. So if we can get some measure of forage um, quality, then that is really the fundamental place to start. Um, if anybody asks me to put a ration together, I usually say, I have to have some information to go on, otherwise I'm making a guess and I'm only making a, a sort of, uh, you know, a wild guess at um, a ration formulation and levels of concentrate. So let's start with a forage analysis. So I'm hoping that you're all going to get one if you haven't already and um, look at that. And I would always encourage you all to check the silage analysis against your forage analysis, against what the uh, forage looks like. We do find a few anomalies sometimes with analysis and I always think it's very good practice to um, just check that it looks like your silage when you get it back. So if you squeeze a sample of silage and if you get any moisture out, it tells you it's going to be less than 25% dry matter. Um, and, you know, that's a good measure. Um, anything below 25% dry matter isn't ideal for sheep. We really want to have a drier silage. Um, we want well-fermented silage that smells sweet and palatable, and certainly a lot of silages made this year had a lot of, certainly big bale silages, had a lot of wonderful residual sugar left because they, they were made in very good conditions and lots of sugar just didn't simply get fermented, and it's still there for the use to um, uh, use as a carbohydrate so uh, source in the rumen. So that's nice. The other thing is obviously um, to feel for the stemminess and the stalkiness of the silage, and then the more sort of sharp edges you get in your hand when you ha ha um, get hold of a sample, um, you know, the more mature that crop is. And you'll know when you, you cut it and what sort of um, stage of growth it was at. So that tells us really, um, you know, where we are in terms of silage analysis. And I looked at a group of silage analyses recently, just 11 samples from a group of farmers, and um, I worked out the difference in compound feed uses, usage according to the, the 
the analyses, and the, they varied by 28 kilograms of concentrates between the worst silage and the best one in that group, which was equivalent to about £6.50 a U for those farmers. So um, a very, very big difference, a very huge influence of um, forage quality on the amount of concentrates required. The other proviso I was put on ration formulation and selection of compounds is based on U condition too. Um, I, I, you know, if you're putting your hands on the U's now, feeling for their condition, um, if they're over fat, delay concentrate feeding. If they're under um, condition, then obviously you need to start sooner. So those things are really important. Um, so, um, right, so we're actually thinking about the supplements we're going to be buying for our U's. So, um, uh, if we've got homegrown cereals, that's fantastic, and an awful lot of people are very tempted this year to make their own mixes because if they've got the homegrown cereal at, say, £130 a tonne, then buying in a protein supplement, maybe that's a protein concentrate, and mixing it to the desired protein level um, could be very straightforward. Um, you've always got to take into account the... Um, the cost of doing that over simply having the product delivered to you um, because there's time and labour involved in, in home mixing which can um, basically negate some of the benefits you might have of actually of cost benefits of actually producing yourself. But And also with sheep farming, unless you've got a large flock buying straights in large quantities, um, then uh, quite often you use the cost um, benefit of buying in bulk over buying in bags. So um, you actually don't win out in the end because you're buying in small quantities. So quite often for us in sheep farming, it's easiest to have the cereals and buy a protein concentrate, which is obviously fully mineralized and ready to go. Um, now, in terms of um, thinking about formulation of compounds or home mixes, um, if we're just thinking about compound feeds and how we select one from our sheep, we've got to be thinking about forage quality because if we um, we know we've got high digestibility of a silage, um, but we've got low protein, well, we actually need a fairly high protein supplement in a small quantity to supplement that silage, whereas the converse might happen if you've got um, a low digestibility forage with a relatively low protein as well, you can probably get away with a lower protein feed in higher quantities. So it's very important to get that balance right. Now, in terms of selecting a compound feed, um, my first uh, port of call is to look at the declaration on the bag. And you know, legally, compounders have to put on the bag oil, protein, fiber, and ash. Now, those are pretty key, um, uh, key pieces of information for you. And they're very basic, but they do give you um, some idea of what sort of um, energy content that uh, feed might have. If we look for um, compounds with less than 10% fiber and less than 10% ash, that's a good thing to do because higher levels of those two um, parameters actually mean generally the compound feed is of low energy. So if we're looking for a high energy feed to go for our a prolific pregnant use just before lambing, then those are two key measures to look out for. Um, the declaration of oil isn't very variable. We're probably varying in, in U feeds between, say, 4 and 6% at the most. Um, but in t and So that's not a very good, um, not all that useful to you in selection. But in terms of protein, um, the figure of 18% protein doesn't tell you anything about the quality of the proteins going into that feed. It just tells you about the total crude protein as me measured simply by multiplying the nitrogen by 0.625 and um, that gives you the total figure, which is not very helpful to you as a sheep farmer. It's just the total amount. So if you are really wanting to look into the information about the quality of a, of a concentrate that you're buying, you need to ask your compounder for a formulation and look at what the ingredients are in that um, mixture. Now, invariably, we find cereals and maybe wheat feed at the top of the list of ingredients, and then we have a whole host of other ingredients that might be present. Um, there are some to look out for, though. Um, two particular ingredients that I um, uh, look out for, in, and I don't mind them being there, but it's just in terms of what quantity is there. Um, sunflower seed meal is a good source of rumen degradable protein, but there are two sorts of sunflower seed meal on the market at the moment, a low pro and a high pro, and the low protein one, which is more commonly found, only has an ME of 9.5. Um, the higher protein one has an ME of about 11.5, so it depends on which one is there. It actually influences the total energy content of the compound. If you bear in mind we're looking for compounds above 12 megajoules per kilogram dry,
dry matter, that's the metabolizable energy. Um, if we start having high inclusions of low energy ingredients, we're never going to reach the target. So, I mean, preferably I'm looking for 12.5 ME or better, um, but if sunflower is there at 20% inclusion, then it's going to struggle to get to that. I like to think sunflower shouldn't be there in any more quantity than 10%. There's another rogue ingredient that everybody should look out for. It's an incredibly poor quality ingredient. It's no better than chopped straw, um, and that is oat feed. The name is um, belies its nature, I'm afraid, um, because that has only got an ME of about six, um, and is there to putting adding fibre, um, but it's not very digestible fibre at that. So look out for that ingredient, and if it is there, it should be very much down at the bottom of the list. As you know, on a bag of feed you get the ingredients in descending order of inclusion so you can start and, and you get an idea of the ingredients but you don't get an idea from the bag label what percentage inclusion of the different ingredients so if I was, if it was you I'd be encouraging you to get a formulation and look at it and see if you recognize the ingredients and are they ones you would trust and, and understand and if you don't know very much about the straits Get hold of the Eblex Mini Feeds directory, which actually gives a little bit of narrative about each feed ingredient, uh, its energy and protein level, and a, a comment about protein quality. So that might be a good exercise to do just to give you a bit more information on the quality of the feed you're, you're, you're buying. It's important that we have sources of rumen degradable protein. That's what the bugs use to um, manufacture microbial protein. But um, in prolific use, DUP, digestible undegradable protein, is also um, important, um, making sure we get high uh, quality colostrum and plenty of it and a subsequent high milk yield in the ewes and healthy strong lambs at birth. So um, think about the quality of the compound um, and don't be, um, don't be persuaded just to feed more, uh, an awful lot of concentrate feed. What I encourage everybody to do is look at the forage and maximize forage intake and hopefully maximize the forage quality. Um, I'm seeing some really good silages this year because we've had a, a good, um, great, we had a good growing year last year. Um, year so we've got some very good forages and many of them the really high quality forages maybe we've got 11 me silage don't need very much concentrate feeds at all um, and some of them may even be adequate with tiny amounts of supplements to take twin bearing use right through to lumming so um, some forages need very very tiny amounts and we might be thinking if we had a red clover silage for instance that might only need a tiny amount of an energy supplement because the protein in uh, red clover silage is a good quality and there's usually plenty of it so a small amount of an energy supplement is all that we, we would need on a silage like that so um, bear in mind that that you need to be looking at the protein and energy of your silages and balancing the, the supplement to go with it Okay, so if I was thinking about um, an ideal compound feed um, and you were asking your supplier, I would be thinking of an energy level of about 12.5 megajoules per kilogram of dry matter. Um, I would be looking for somewhere in the region of 18 to 21% protein. But I say, bear in mind that is very dependent on the forage you're feeding. And there are some quite low protein forages this year that need supplementing with rumen degradable protein to make um, rumen efficiency as, as good as it can be. We want less than 10% ash. We want less than 10% fiber. Ideally, some good quality protein. And one ingredient I always look out for is soybean meal because that's our best quality vegetable protein and does tend to confer um, good milk yield and good colostrum quality. Um, and um, there is a school of thought that with um, high quality silages, all we need is to give some soybean meal, which is working well in practice. So um, often recommended at 100 grams per um, lamb born, or lamb expected, should I say. Um, the other one to look out for on the um, formulation would be uh, levels of vitamin E, perhaps. Um, certainly research work has shown that vitamin E has a benefit in terms of lamb um, viability and lamb thriftiness and lamb ability to stand and suckle quickly after, immediately after birth. So we're looking for, particularly on low quality forages, a level of between 100 and 200 milligrams per kilogram of vitamin E. Um, so that's uh, an important one. Now, just coming on to home mixing, um, you might like to be considering things like um, wheat distillers dark grains, which is a, a good buy on the market as a straight at the moment, um, rapeseed meal, soya, blends of those sorts of mixtures of proteins, and they are available through various suppliers at the moment, um, or perhaps buying a protein concentrate, which is fully mineralized. 
If you want to play around with um, making up some home mixes, got your own cereals and some straights that are available easily, um, then the Eblex blend calculator is a good place to look to start, um, you know, uh, trying to identify what sort of, um, you know, mix you might want um, and get it all organized and planned. Now, in terms of working out the levels of concentrate seeds you need to go for, um, there's a very good table in the latest um, Eblex booklet on um, you feeding, and that gives you some very good guidelines based on potential intake, dry matter intake of forage um, at different stages of pregnancy, um, and um, it helps you to work it through on the back of the envelope, basically, um, to give you some um, good guidelines on, on levels of supplement with different qualities of forage. So, um, anyway, so I would just like to say, um, consider work with um, you know, your compounder or nutritionist to get a ration formulated according to your forage quality, but think about the condition of your use and not overfeeding concentrates. We really like to be thinking about um, maximizing forage and minimizing concentrates to keep costs down, but giving the optimum diet that's going to give you the optimum results. Now, in terms of concentrate quantities, I think there's very few silages justify more than a kilogram of concentrates. Very few forages, uh, or hay or silage, um, and we should never be feeding more than half a kilogram in one feed. Otherwise, we disturb rumen fermentation and limit forage utilization and uh, effective fermentation. So, um, always split feeds once you're feeding more than a half a kilo. Um, and you will find that um, on, say, complete diets, you get higher forage intake and a more stable rumen environment and a more efficient utilization of forage because we're not disturbing the rumen with high levels of sort of starchy um, or high sugar concentrates. So if you're going to levels of more than a kilo of concentrates, then um, I think it's probably a good idea to be having some other supplement in the pen with use, particularly triplet use, um, maybe some sort of lick or block that would give them that little and often feed that might um, keep them the right side of the line in terms of twin lamb disease if, if an extra supplement is needed. Um, anyway, I think I may well have covered my time now, Chris, so um, I'm sure there's lots of other questions that I could have covered or other areas I could have covered, but um, hopefully that will come out in some questions. Okay, Chris, is that okay? Yeah, that, that's, that's great, Kate. Perfectly to time. Thanks very much. And okay. Quite a lot of information there, everyone. So just to remind you that Kate has put together a little sheet to accompany her 15 minutes on the phone and you can request that at brpconfortebleks.org.uk. Uh, if you just ask for that, uh, just ask for the fact sheet, we'll send that through to you. All the fact sheets are available on the website as well, as is that nutrition manual which Kate mentioned. Um, also, just to, uh, to help you in your uh, search, if you want to go to the blend calculator that Kate mentioned, go to the eBlex site, click on the Better Returns program page, and click under Tools, and you'll see the blend calculator in there. Uh, so, Kate, we've got a couple of questions come in from callers. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, one from a lady who has a supply of field beans right. uh, for use in feeding ewes. Mm -hmm. Just the question is, seems to be, does she need to roll them? Can they be fed whole? Um, right. And she's also using, um, I'm just going to read this, I'm using Oats Fodder Beet and Promol, sorry if we're mentioning the product name, uh, as right. if necessary. Okay, um, field beans, yeah, um, I have known them being fed whole, but they can be incredibly dry and incredibly solid and hard, more like bullets than beans. Um, so, Chris, I would, but, but the risk of, of cracking them sometimes is that they shatter and just go into a powder. Um, so, uh, sheep can cope with them whole, depending on the forage they're being fed with, um, but I suppose it depends if they're being fed in a mix with something else, I probably would uh, crack them. Um, but bear in mind, they've got quite a lot of starch, and if you do pulverize them too badly, they're very starchy and could cause a bit of acidosis if they're fed in large amounts. Um, I see that um, the question, you know, they said the question that oats are being fed, and oats would be a good um, sort of fibrous feed to feed food with field beans. Uh, the only the only feeling I've got the field beans are um, in the order of 25% protein, which is and they're a good source of rumen degradable protein, not of DUP, um, and 
to be fed with oats and fodder beet, um, both quite low protein feeds, I think you'd be needing some extra protein in that diet, depending on the prolificity of the ewes and the forage quality. Um, so the Promal, I can't remember the um, analysis of Promal, but I think it has some extra protein in it, um, room and degradable protein largely, but I, I wouldn't like to sort of quote that really. So I hope that helps um, the lady who sent that question in. Uh, I'll come back to the issue of protein in a minute, but I've got a question here from somebody feeding sugar beet, uh, which yep. I think you've always said is a good feed. Yep, Are there I any have. recommendations in terms of um, maximum amounts? And I know some people soak, uh, certainly the horsey yep. people tend to soak it. Should we yep. soak it and, or not? Um, I don't ever recommend soaking. I think if you want to, you can, but I don't think it's necessary. Um, I think it's a very sweet, palatable feed that is, is you know, great for sheep, really. Um, but I don't think you want to go to, you know, very high levels. Relative value of it, Chris, is below that of cereals, although we are always willing to pay more for it because of its safe and, and very palatable uh, nature, really. Um, but I would have thought, uh, never been to a kilo of, cons of, of sugar beet. It's always been, in rations I've put together, uh, a portion of a diet rather than just a sole supplement, occasionally a sole supplement in hill farms. Um, but I think if you were getting to a kilo, you might be getting to a very large amount of fibre that does swell up quite dramatically in the rumen. Um, and I think levels of more like half a kilo or more like for more typical and would you need to supplement that for protein levels later on you depending on the forage quality again chris i mean i i have i've seen rations they've been red clover silage with just a small amount of beet pulp perfect no problem but if it's a more moderate pro protein level then you would because um sugar beet pulp is only about nine percent protein mm. so that wouldn't be adequate if you're on a nine percent protein hay you know, there would not be enough protein for used to, to do well, produce strong lambs with lots of men, have lots of milk um, on that sort of um, diet. So coming back to protein sources, Kate, you mentioned um, high ME silage uh, yep. and, and the possibility of only needing to supplement with protein. Yep. Your recommendation was ideally soya bean meal at 100 grams per lamb per day, if I understood yep. that correctly. Yep. Yep. But are there alternatives? I've never bought soya bean, <coughs> soya bean meal direct. Well, how, how do you go about buying that? And are there any alternatives that might be available? <laughs> Yeah, you can buy it. You can buy it in bags, Chris. Um, it's never cheap in bags, of course. So it's going to be an awful lot more than the bulk price. Um, so and and in that sense, it's it's you know it's limited. Um, but uh, if you were wanting to buy, there are other. Uh, proteins of course rapeseed meal is another protein source that's used very widely in feed compounds and in blends um, it hasn't got the same uh, protein quality as soya and it's often actually presented I came across one the other day just a soya rape blend which is fully mineralized and could be used as a straight on farm which actually provides a nice balance of room and degradable protein and DUP um, with full mineralization so that made it sort of nice and easy and um, accessible to everybody in sheep producing not, not just um, farmers with large flocks um, there's a whole host of other things. We've got wheat distillers grains that has a high level of protein. Um, we've got a few other things: maize gluten, a sunflower meal, which I wouldn't recommend as a straight on farm because of its high, you know highly fibrous nature. But um, for many farmers, a protein concentrate is probably the simplest, which is fully mineralised and ready to to go. Basically, Chris. Mm. Uh, so just to remind anybody, if they're interested in looking at alternatives, Kate was listing, uh, running off a list there. There is a mini feeds directory, again, on the website. I'm sorry to keep advertising these things, but they're there for you to get value from. Uh, that's under the feed, forage and feed section of the BRP pages, the mini feeds directory. Uh, gives you uh, the range of feeds available, goes into lots of alternatives like biscuit meal and bread meal and so on. Gives you the basic uh, nutritional value and that you you could expect and any sort of uh, do's and don'ts that you must do or not do if you're feeding those feeds um i think we'll move on to we'll come back to some questions to you kate later on because uh, i've okay. got a couple of questions that might be relevant for both you and harriet if we could cover those off at the end yep. um so harriet has been waiting patiently i will hand over to harriet uh who's going to talk to us about a range of topics uh in terms of health of our flock leading up to lambing harriet Okay, thank you, Chris, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about um, really vet and med issues um, running up to lambing. So I thought we'd start with looking at uh, vaccination against clostridial diseases. 
where we have um, two um, possible vaccines that can be used here, one of which, um, which is probably the most common one, is Heptavac P. Now, that contains um, seven different, uh, protection against seven different strains of Clostridia and Pastorella, that's the P part of it. Um, and the other vaccine is Rivoxin 10, which is just a Clostridial vaccine. Rivoxin 10 actually does cover against an extra type of Clostridia, Clostridium sordelii, which isn't covered in Heptavac P. Um, Clostridium sordelii is um, a type of Clostridia that was only uh, discovered causing disease in sheep uh, maybe mm, 15, 20 years ago now. So it's a relatively recent one and occasionally causes losses in um, all types of sheep, really. It causes sudden death. And it can also cause um, death of lambs in utero, um, and so therefore the death of the ewe from the lambs dying inside. But it is relatively com uncommon um, causing disease in that way. Uh, the data sheets for two vaccines do differ slightly. So when we're giving a pre-lambing booster, which um, is only relevant to um, use that have had an initial primary course of two shots at one time and then they're having a booster pre-lamming. Uh, the Heptavac P advises that the booster is given between six and four weeks pre-lamming, whilst the Provoxin 10 um, recommends between eight and two weeks pre-lamming. And it's always as well to follow the data sheet as much as possible because obviously these products have been trialed. These have been found to be the times that they are most um, effective. Um, and if you've got a long spread out lambing period, ideally try and split your use. Hopefully if they've been rattled, you've got rattle marks or maybe from the scanner, you'll know roughly when they're going to lamb and try and vaccinate them in those windows rather than doing everything in one go, which will mean some may be done too far ahead of lambing, which may mean their antibodies and colostrum aren't as good as if they've been done actually at the, um, at the correct time. And Something that's very important is that both vaccines should be injected under the skin, not just sort of intra-sheep. So that does mean putting the skin up and injecting into that little tent of skin that you've made, um, which is always, I think, relatively time-consuming to do that properly, to make sure that the vaccine does go under the skin, that you change your needle regularly so you're not risking um, introducing infection at the same time. Uh, and I think when you're giving your um, clostridial vaccine, it's a really useful time to hand your use, hands on backs, assess their body condition score, decide are there some thin ones that need pulling out and putting separately, or maybe they're a bit too fat, but it's just an ideal opportunity to um, condition score the use. So you're likely to be um, doing this around um, four weeks pre-lambing. So the Provoxin 10 says you can go up to two weeks pre-lambing, but the closer you go to lambing, uh, the more careful obviously you need to be in terms of handling um, and not stressing the use. But this period, um, three to four weeks pre-lambing, is a useful time uh, to assess whether your feeding is adequate in meeting the needs of the use in terms of energy and protein. Um, and something that um, vets can do is to blood sample a small number of ewes just to check their energy and protein status to see if the diet is um, meeting their needs. So generally what we'd look to sample would be, say, five or six ewes um, out of a few different groups. You might sample your um, twin-bearing mature ewes, maybe your triplet ewes, and maybe um, five or six twin-bearing yearling ewes. Um, I always like to see, if possible, the yearlings kept separate from the mature ewes because they generally don't compete particularly well with the older ewes uh, where feed is uh, restricted. So if you're feeding concentrates, um, the mature older ewes tend to be greedier and get more than their share. And the yearlings that actually probably need a little bit more because they're trying to grow as well, don't get their full share. So keeping the yearlings separate is always um, good. So we can sample, like I say, maybe five or six um, sheep per group. And we'll generally check... Um, three or four uh, metabolites in the blood. So we'd look at um, two different things to assess protein. We'd look at urea, which is an indicator of short-term protein status. So it's telling us if the diet they're, they're getting now is supplying enough protein. Um, now with urea, 
Um, it's important that we don't blood sample them straight after they've just been fed. If they just had a concentrate feed and we sample them straight away afterwards, the urea will probably be high just from that recent feed. So we need to wait at least four hours after that um, feed. If they're on a TMR, it doesn't really matter because you don't get the same uh, peaks and troughs. So urea indicates short-term protein status, and we can also look at albumin, which um, gives more of an indicator of long-term protein status, and that can be really useful um, for picking up other things, like you might do some bloods and find the albumins are low, and that um, triggers an investigation that finds the reason for that is that the sheep are infected with liver fluke. So there may be other reasons other than just diet that's making the albumin um, lower than it should be. For energy, we look at a metabolite called beta-hydroxybutyrate, often just abbreviated to BHB. Uh, and that, um, the BHB levels are elevated when the ewe is trying to mobilize her own body tissues to produce energy. So she's not getting enough energy in the diet, and that's making her mobilize her own body tissues. So if BHB levels are elevated, that can tell us that we've got some ewes that are heading towards getting twin lamb disease. Um, and hopefully we can then maybe pick them up before we've got any ewes with twin lamb, and we can correct the diet uh, before we actually run into any problems. Because twin, with twin lamb disease, the survival rate is relatively poor, really, once they're obviously showing clinical signs of it. So prevention is vastly better than cure. And another thing that we might add in to this um, blood profile would be to look at magnesium levels. Uh, and this is it's not really actually to look at the magnesium level itself, but more as an indicator um, of whether there may be an issue with calcium because um, if magnesium levels are low, this can influence how the um, calcium is mobilized in the body. So you're more likely to get used to suffer from hypocalcemia. I mentioned uh, twin lamb disease briefly and how we can use um, the bloods to look at that. And actually, aside from doing um, the full blood profile, a lot of vets will now carry little handheld um, analyzers. They're similar to the sort of things that um, human diabetics will use just to measure their blood glucose, but we can get special strips that measure um, BHB in the sheep. So we can just um, sample a few use and just give you an idea literally there and then, is the energy in the diet okay or are we heading uh, towards some problems? And one of the issues um, with uh, ewes getting twin lamb disease is often um, not necessarily, well, not necessarily that the diet doesn't contain enough energy, but it can be things like the yearlings are being bullied a bit and aren't getting their fair share rather than the ration itself um, isn't correct. Uh, just to say a little bit on prolapses, um, as you'll all be aware, they generally happen in ewes that are carrying two or more lambs, and there are various theories as to why they happen, but um, probably the, the most commonly held view is that it's excess internal fat inside the ewe that is one of the contributory factors. There's so much fat there, there just isn't really room for everything else, for the fetuses and the rumen, um, and something has to give, so you end up with the ewe having a um, prolapse. Um, and it seems that ewes that have overfat in mid-pregnancy seem to be um, particularly at risk. So if you've had a problem uh, one year and you're looking in future years to try and reduce the incidence, um, well, the first thing I suggest you do is make sure that any ewes that do prolapse get marked um, so that you can cull them. Uh, I think quite often uh, people have the best will that they're going to cull ewes that are prolapse, but if they're not um, permanently marked, maybe put an extra tag in or notch the ear or something then, um, or if you've got EID, record it on your cull list, um, but otherwise they can slip through the net and come around again, and then there's a high chance that they will prolapse again the next year. Uh, monitoring body condition score throughout the whole year, not just when the ewes are pregnant, um, can help you to identify the ewes that are getting over fast at any time, and then they can be put on a, um, a diet or hopefully slim them down a little bit. Um, and another thing that seems to help is in giving the ewes um, when they're in late pregnancy a chance to move around a bit, whether you maybe let them out into a yard by day or something, so they're not just literally standing up, lying down and eating um, because lack of exercise seems to um, predispose as well. 
In terms of treating prolapses, I'd say the most important thing is to act as soon as you see the prolapse um, because the longer you leave it out, the more damage happens and then when the prolapse has been replaced, the ewe feels uncomfortable so she's more likely to keep straining um, after the prolapse has been put in. So if you come across a ewe with just a small prolapse, you want to clean the prolapse off with warm water and some mild antiseptic solution like hibiscrub. Gently push it back in. If it doesn't go in easily, um, if you're struggling to get it go back to go back in, then the U really needs um, an epidural injection, which obviously means um, that needs to be given by a vet. Um, so if you end up, if you find a U with a prolapse, say the size of a football, that U would need an epidural. So she needs to be taken to a vet or a vet to come out to give her the epidural. Then she won't be able to feel the prolapse and it will go in with no difficulty, hopefully. Uh, and then harnesses are now considered um, probably the best treatment for prolapses. So a nylon harness, you're not um, causing any trauma to the ewe herself. The harness is just put on and they seem to be very successful. And most vets these days would prefer to use a harness than to um, stitch a prolapse in. Uh, some harnesses also supply a plastic spoon with them. These are a no-no. I would just say the spoon wants to go straight in the bin. Uh, once you put something in there and leave it in, it acts as a route of infection, so infection can track up the spoon and then get into the uterus and cause the death of the lambs. And also, just by leaving something inside the ewe, she's more likely to keep straining because she wants to push it back out. And all prolapse cases should be given an injection of antibiotic and an anti-inflammatory injection, um, which obviously may vary according to um, which your vet will prefer, but should have an antibiotic and an anti-inflammatory. Uh, just a brief word on worming use around lambing time. Um, the main reason we are doing this is because um, around lambing time, the demand for protein is very high because you need protein for the fetus and for the milk, um, and antibodies also are made up of protein. So when the demand for protein is high, often there isn't enough for the ewe to maintain her antibody level to worms, so ewes around lambing will generally pass out more worm eggs. Most of the rest of the year, you don't pass out many worm eggs. So we need to consider worming ewes at lambing that are under more pressure. So that's your ewes carrying twins or triplets, maybe some thin singles. But um, overworming adult sheep selects for resistant worms. So we want to try to leave some of our ewes unwormed at lambing time. So generally, your fit singles won't need doing. But it's something you want to discuss with your vet prior to lambing each year, what worm you should be using and when is the best time to give it. And similarly with liver fluke, if you're on a farm that you know carries liver fluke, then you probably will already have treated your ewes in the autumn, and you might be thinking, well, do I need to treat them again uh, when I house them, or do I need to treat them again at lambing? And it's very difficult to um, give sort of a blueprint of advice on that, because it will depend at what time of year you've housed them. After they were treated the last time, were they put back on fluky ground, or did they go onto clean ground? What's the weather been like since you last treated them? Has it been very cold, in which case they probably haven't picked up more fluke? Has it been warm and wet, or maybe they have picked up more fluke? So it's something, once again, that you want to discuss with your vet as to what you're best to do in terms of treating the use um, for liver fluke pre-lambing or around the time of lambing. But one thing you do want to consider is what you don't want to happen is you turn the use back out in the spring, um, and they're passing out fluke eggs that get onto the pasture, get into the snails, and maintain the life cycle for um, the following year. Uh, just a quick word on abortions. Uh, the rule of thumb is that if more than 2% of a group of ewes have aborted, or if several ewes have aborted in one day, then there's probably an infection causing the problem. Um, and in that case, it's really worthwhile uh, having some investigations done so you can identify the cause. The most commonly um, diagnosed causes of abortion in, sheep in the UK are still enzootic abortion and toxoplasmosis, although there are very effective vaccines against these two conditions, so um, it's quite disappointing, but certainly um, if you were to have enzootic abortion confirmed in your flock, then you'd know that the best thing thereafter is to vaccinate and all flocks really are at risk of toxoplasmosis because that is um, the infection there is spread in cat feces and it can be almost impossible, I think, anywhere on mainland Britain to be sure that your ewes um, couldn't have been exposed to cat feces, whether it's on straw, um, cats have been in the pasture, but 
I, in my view, all youth are at risk of toxoplasmosis and um, all sheep farmers will be as well to vaccinate their ewes. I think there's a bit of a um, perception that vaccinating against abortion is costly, but um, generally in commercial flocks, you only need to vaccinate a ewe once in her lifetime, so you vaccinate her before she goes to the tub for the first time, and that's usually sufficient uh, to control these diseases in a flock. So the cost works out at roughly about um, £1.50 per ewe per year, to keep the whole flock vaccinated, um, or keep, keep, keep the whole flock covered against both antibiotic abortion and toxoplasmosis. Um, important always to remember with um, abortions in use that the infections that cause abortion, as well as those two, there are things like Salmonella, Campylobacter, Listeria, and most of them are infectious to people as well. Uh, so you always want to wear gloves um, when you're handling the you and any abortion material and remember that the infections are particularly dangerous to pregnant women. So it's just always worth um, remembering that pregnant women shouldn't be going near um, sheep that are due to lamb or at lambing time. So I think, Chris, I've probably uh, filled my time, uh, and I'll stop there and see if we've got any questions. That's perfect, Harriet. Thanks very much. Bang on time. Thank you very much. Um, just to remind everybody, if you want to email a question to either of our speakers, you can email it to brpconf at eblex.ahdb.org.uk or you can text us, if you're quick, to 07973 uh, We've got a, f a few questions uh, for you, Harriet, and then I've got a couple for you both. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, we talked about uh, Heptavac P and Brovaxin, I think is the other one. Uh, can you... Can you mix them? And by that, I mean, if you've bought sheep in and you don't know what program they were on before, can you use uh, either or and it would still be sort of um, compatible with the previous vaccine? Or would you have to start from scratch? Okay, I would say ideally you would start from scratch again. Certainly if you were to give, uh, use a Heptavac P uh, booster and they hadn't had the primary cause for Heptavac P, you wouldn't be getting the benefit of the pastorella cover that is in the Heptavac P, so you'd be losing that. It probably would boost uh, some of the clostridial components, and, like clostridium perfringens, which causes poppy kidney. But um, ideally, you would start again. It's the same the other way around. If the user had, had a primary cause of Heptavac P and then you gave them the Brevoxin, you wouldn't get the benefit from the Brevoxin of the protection against clostridium sordellii because they haven't had the primary cause. Mm. So I would sort of argue, in an ideal world, you would start them again, if you don't start them again but just give a booster, you're doing some good but not getting the full benefit out of the vaccines. Mm. And I guess the challenge for all of us is the spread of lambing. And as you said, you need to really do be doing it um, over the periods they recommend prior to lambing. So we've all got the challenge of trying to work out whether we're going to be lambing in the next four weeks or six to eight weeks' time. Yes, and that is is difficult, but... Um, Ruddling your tuts and changing the colour, that really helps, doesn't it? Mm. Or some um, some scanners offer stage scanning, so they'll tell you uh, they're going to lamb in that three weeks or the next three weeks, and you can group them, group them that way. So that's probably something for us all to think about in time for next year, because if we hadn't rattled our rams too late, and if we didn't think to ask the scanner too late, but if we are concerned about the spread of our lambing period, we should perhaps consider that for next year to get some idea of which lambs are going to be, la sorry, which ewes are going to be lambing early and late. Um, Harriet, just another question. While we're on vaccines, got one about the abortion vaccine. Uh, someone's put um, lambing early. They put the tup in uh, middle of September. When would they need to order the toxoplasmosis vaccine? Okay. So um, they're lambing soon, I guess, if they put the ram in on the 12th of September. Yes. Uh, the vaccine should be given um, no less than three weeks before tapping. Uh, in terms of ordering it, uh, the, the Toxavax is unusual, actually, in that it is ordered direct from the company that make it, MSD, um, and they could order it well before. Uh, the way it works, you'd phone your vet and then we send in a form saying we would like it to be delivered week commencing when the client wants to use it. Because one of the problems with the Toxoplasma vaccine, Toxavax, 
it's a very fragile vaccine and it's kept frozen and it's thawed out to be sent to us and then only has a shelf life of 7 to 10 days. So we always have to make sure with the client, when are you going to be able to use the vaccine? And we'd order it just prior to that time. Um, so it is quite um, very important, really. If you if you don't use it within that time, it really won't be any good. It'll lose its um, potency. Um, and I would suggest that people actually sort of preempt and order it maybe a few weeks before even they think they're going to need it, but give their vet a date when they when they want it for. But it um, is at least three weeks pre-tupping. Pre Okay. Uh, this this topic possibly could be covered at the, on the next call, but we've got we've had a question about pathogenic coxy. Uh, someone's had a problem with it in the past. Should they be treating the ewes with an anti-coxy bucket, followed up by a drench for the lambs once turned out, or what would your advice be in terms of dealing with a previous coxy problem? Uh, as okay. with many people, he can't use any different pasture at turnout, so uh, there's likely to be a you know he's they're going to face a challenge, I guess. Okay, well, it's probably correctly identified that it is the ewes that are the main source of the coccidial oocysts uh, to start with, probably, and then um, as lambing progresses, the lambs are passing lots of coxie out and contaminating pastures for the later born lambs. Um, but there, there can be some merit in um, treating ewes, but it depends very much on the, the management situation. I mean, some people put um, decox in buckets, but intake by ewes is probably very uneven, so it's probably not doing much good. I would really encourage, in terms of the ewes, correct body condition and feeding plenty of protein so they maintain um, good immunity. So I just really, it's easier to talk about general principles here, I think, because every situation is different as to whether you may benefit from treating the ewes. There may be some benefit, but probably the best way then would be to have the decox put in the cake so you know each ewe is getting X amount of cake per head per day, mm -hmm and therefore you can put the right amount of decox in. And then drenching the lambs um, early before they start to show any signs of um, disease and uh, maybe considering there are different products available to treat the lambs and some uh, treat more stages than the others. So I think looking at what you're going to treat the lambs with. But as you said, Chris, maybe we can talk about this slightly more on the, in the next yeah. um Cool. Okay, we'll, we'll put that down as a topic to focus on next time. Um, uh, Harriet, can we just go back to the vaccination issue? We've had another question in, um, and I'm not sure of the names of the products here, uh, but we are going to mention products, so I apologise for that. If someone's had uh, their sheep on Brevoxin 10 and Ovipa Ovipast Plus, can they okay. be moved over to the Heptavax system without restarting again, or would they have to go back to the initial and then the booster? So Bravo um, and Ken and Ovipass, Ovipass Plus, can they go straight over to Heptavac? Well, uh, I'm just sort of mulling this over, really. The Ovipass um, is just purely a pasteurella boost um, vaccine. So they are doing sort of similar to what's in the Heptavac P. I'm going to slightly hedge that one and say I would... Um, suggest that it be best discussed with a, a vet from MSD who make Heptavac P and the Ovipast and see what their their views are on that. There is some logic that you probably could just just move over without having to start again, really, but I still think it would be worth just discussing it with the, the vaccine company. Um, one for you both here, just to bring you in, Kate, if you're there. This is yep, uh, yep, still here. somebody's interested in, uh, it's quite an interesting one, I don't know the answer to this one, uh, when lambing indoors, um, the, this, the, they currently feed twice a day and leave the lights on at night. Mm -hmm. What evidence is there to support feeding once a day to reduce the likelihood of lambing at night but without adversely impacting on new nutrition? I guess this is the answer we all want. We don't want anything lambing in the middle of the night. night so how, yeah, do we yeah. how do we affect it? Any tips? Mm. I certainly, I mean, I, I haven't got any um, real, real evidence. Um, just one or two farmers who practice turning lights off at night um, and uh, find that less lambs, uh, less used lamb at night if they turn the lights off. Um, as far as feeding once or twice a day, uh, my view on that is that um, 
it, depending on the amount of concentrates, if you if you are at a low level of concentrates, well, once a day is fine. But if you are feeding a large amount of concentrates at one feed, that's very counterproductive in terms of um, room and fermentation of forages. So um, I, I would say that was my fundamental requirement first, to get the feeding right. And if it demands twice a day feeding, then we have to go with that, really, rather than delivering a kilo of concentrates all in one day, in, in one dose, um, because that can precipitate you know, large meals of concentrate, acidosis, prolapse, all sorts of things. So I'm not sure. Harry, have you anything on the, the, the light thing, and uh, you know, sort of feeding and um, and uh, lambing in the night? Uh, no, I haven't. You know, the light I'm really, really not sure about. I agree with you. I've got some clients who say they turn the lights out and they feel mm. that fewer la- yep. use lamb at night. Uh, yep. um, I think, I believe with suckler cows, there has been some work done that suggests um, if you feed your suckler cows in the evening, about 6 o'clock, they're less likely to calve during the night than if they have their main feed in the morning, which mm-hmm. um, that is completely different. Most people do tend to feed their cows once a day and they'd be fed in the morning. Uh, yeah. But I don't, mm. I'm not aware really of um, any real evidence. Being done in use. Yeah. No, mm. no. Okay. I was only well, discussing this. Sorry, Chris. I was only discussing with colleagues yesterday, actually, and, and one of them said that they feed, uh, they feed, and then they use obviously sit down and eat and ruminate for a little while. But um, an hour or two later, they all start lambing in profusion, um, whatever time of the day it is. <laughs> but um, anyway, no, I haven't got any proper scientific okay. evidence. Just a, a general one here for both of you again. Um, the issue of overfed use or fat use this winter, I think a number of people with the good autumn we had, a number of people have experienced very fit use this year. Um, obviously, from Kate's perspective, da- very dangerous to start starving things and slimming them down too quickly. Uh, yeah. but, but you both mentioned that as an issue, one for on the nutritional side and one on the sort of prolapse side. Any any tips for anyone who's got overfit use at this stage coming up to lambing in terms of how to manage them? Well, um, shall I start, Harriet? Yeah. Uh, my view is that um, if you have got very fit use, just delay the start of concentrate feeding for a week or two over where you might have done it normally. Um, but it, there is no way that you should be um, limiting concentrate levels in the last three weeks before lambing because that has such a huge influence on lamb birth weight and viability so um and and fat use tend to have a lower appetite than thin use close to lambing so it's really important they they get their allocation of concentrates if there's any slimming down to do because it must be done before four weeks before lambing and that could only be a relatively small amount of slimming i would say yeah and harriet yes. um, the only comment i would add to that is in uh my sort of day-to-day work i come across use that are too fat coming up to the point of lambing, rarely, too thin, very frequently. So mm. I think it's much more common that people haven't really realised how much you condition the use have lost coming up to lambing, um, and they actually lamb down much thinner. That's partly if they're carrying two or three lambs, just the belly's distended and it makes them look, they, people think, oh, you know, she's really fat, and then they lamb and just, it's almost as if the yeah, they go to mm. nothing. Yes, mm. so... Um, in practice, yeah. yes, um, being over fat is far less frequently a problem than um, being too thin at lambing time. So again, just uh, that if anyone's experiencing that problem, it's, it's too late probably for this year, you're going to have to live with the consequences, but it just endorses the value of body condition scoring throughout the season at the key points. Absolutely, and we have got yeah. information on that in uh, the sheet manual number four in terms of when to body condition score and, and what to be looking out for, and there are different times through the year. Um, yeah. Okay, well, well, listen, thank you. Oh, sorry, Harriet, there was one more very quickly. I think um, there was an issue over Cydectin 2% LA and whether that is or isn't a good product to use for use at lambing time. Uh, any quick thoughts on that one? Yes, Chris, I do. Um, yes, some of you might... Um, have read there has been a little report recently of someone who used the Cydexin 2% LA injection, so that's the long-acting Cydexin injection, in their use at lambing time, and it was followed through looking at worm egg counts in the lambs, and this first year it was used, it seemed brilliant. The lambs that were born from the use that had the Cydexin long-acting um, had fewer worm eggs than the lambs from the untreated use. But Although the results are very good and it's probably repeatable, um, I think just a word of warning that um, 
Sardectin injections and particularly long-acting uh, select quite strongly for resistant worms. So it's considered, um, scops will consider it quite a risky thing to do and not really a good idea. So it's something that you might do for short-term gain, the first year you use it, maybe the second year, and then it will become less effective and the active ingredient in cydectin, which is moxidectin, may no longer work, may not kill the worms on your farm and you're running into big problems. So um, unfortunately, it may be one of those things that seems too good to be true, I think, really. So uh, proceed with caution, really. And, and general advice, as always, is in terms of product choice, talk to your vet who hopefully has some knowledge of the flock and your circumstances so you can get the right product and avoid wasting Absolutely. money or cause further problems. Okay, we've run a little bit over. I apologize that, for that, but we did. it was nice to have some questions coming in, and I think that gets right to the heart of your particular concern. So um, thank you to both speakers for uh, the sort of uh, from answering from the hip for that last little bit. <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to draw the call to a close, just to let you know that our, our next call, we've planned three of these uh, with Kate and Harriet leading up to Lamming, so our next call will be Friday the 13th, um, so I guess we'll all be indoors with the doors locked and the windows closed and curtains pulled being Friday the 13th, so we'll all be here at half past one on Friday the 13th, uh, look at Har Kate will be looking at nutritional issues in late pregnancy um, and Harriet will be looking at avoiding disease over lambing time and, and moving into turnout. So a couple of issues there to look at. Uh, another advert for eBlex, if you haven't signed up to it, I really do recommend you go to flock ta flockcalendar.com. Uh, this is a calendar we've created. You put your lambing date or your tapping date in, and it's preset with a number of tasks like vaccination for, for cox um, clostridial diseases, and it will send you an email the week before you're due to do it based on a calendar which Harriet's help us, helped us pull together. You can also uh, put bespoke tasks in there if you wish to. So if you're doing your abortion vaccines and you, want, you put them in for September or whenever it is, it will remind you a couple of weeks before you're due to do it uh, so that you can be timely with that. So it's a really useful tool. It's absolutely free. It's flockcalendar.com. Um, also, if you, uh, particularly for those producers in the north of England, we've still got some uh, late winter U nutritional events coming up uh, in, your, in the Yorkshire area in particular. I think there are some others. And we've also got two Uplands conferences, so I would urge you to call our events team, and the number for that is 01904 That's 01904 Seven seven one two double one. Uh, for any events, they'll give you information on any of the events we've got coming up all over the country. But we know there are some uh, new nutrition events coming up in the North of England plus two conferences. So, uh, thank you very much for being with us. We've had up to forty people on the call this afternoon, so I hope you've all enjoyed it. We haven't had to drive anywhere, uh, so thanks very much and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Goodbye.